Okay, today I'm in Clevedon with a professional punter, Mark Holder. Welcome. Thanks, thanks very much for agreeing to talk to no, us. Thank uh, you for coming down. Right. Now, I've, um, I've known of you for a long time. Sort right. of the same era on the racehorse and stuff. All good, I hope. But uh, well, I was Googling, as I tend to, when I'm, uh, and I found a quote that says, you won't be a pro punter forever. If I did, I'd end up in a padded cell one day with somebody passing me toast under the door. Now, that was 1996, yeah. and you're still here. So, 22 uh, years on. Um, yeah, well, I guess things sort of just develop as the years go by. Um, it was, I found it tough then to stay ahead of everybody and it's probably tough now but I think as you get older and more experienced you certainly understand the way of dealing with the ups and downs that come in racing and it makes you more able to sort of perhaps not get overly high when things go brilliant for you and not get overly down when things go against you. Okay, now before we go into the technicalities of how you've made it pay for so long, um, you sort of got it in the blood, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so we were, I grew up on a farm, um, privileged in the respect that we, were, we had horses and we could ride them, but that's probably where the privilege started and stopped because we were tenant farmers, we were fairly poor. I was the youngest of four, so I got everyone's hand-me-downs. Um, but my father was a keen punter. He'd had a couple of horses in training as a permit. Well, he had them in training with Roddy Armitage in Lambourne or East Ilsley. And he then trained a couple uh, under permit, which meant that he could only train for himself. OK, now I read somewhere that your, um, your grandfather was a bit of a gambler. Lost the milk check, hot better than something. <laughs> <laughs> he was, yeah. We milked cows for years. I don't know sure how big the milk check was. Uh, but yeah, so it was basically gambling was totally in my blood from a from a, a young age. And my father was a, was a, more of a gambler than my uh, grandfather, but and my brother was probably as big a gambler as my my father. And you know that's all I ever saw. So I I grew up with seeing people gamble. I gambled at school. Um, everybody says it, but I I think I probably used to run a book on the Grand National at school. And your father was a successful trainer. Yeah, so um, he had a permit in 1980. So the permit meant he could only train horses for himself. But as was the case, and it's probably still the case now, that people, they had a permit, the horses ran in their name, but they might have trained them for other people. So he had a bit of success with a horse called Jocks Bond and Mayotte. And indeed, Jocks Bond, who won in 1980, was, I think that was Paul Nichols. In fact, I know it was Paul Nichols, uh, champion trainer, his first winner under rules, and that was at Newton Abbott. And he also won with Mayotte, she won at Utoxeter. And the people, actually, I think uh, Mayotte was probably part owned or might be fully owned by somebody else. And now they wanted the horses to run in their name. So in 1981, he took out a full license. And we started with three horses that year. Mayotte, she won five. Jocks Bond, he won three. And John's Present, he won three. So three horses, 11 winners in our first year, yeah. And you won the Triumph Hurdle. I didn't, um, the horses did. Yes. <laughs> uh, the yeah, 19, 1989, yeah, Igdam. He won the Triumph Hurdle, Cheltenham Festival. Um, I think Dad had bought him for about, 20, about 25 grand um, at the uh, Newmarket Autumn Sales. Um, and he, he, very, very slow horse, really slow. Uh, we'd run him over two and a half miles. He just wanted a severe test of stamina. In 1989, it was the year that Desert Orchid, I think Desert Orchid won the, the Gold Cup that year. And it was nearly abandoned because of the rain that had fallen on the track. And the Triumph Hurdle, it, the, the whole course was run, you know, you can watch the video now, and they're splashing through the, the water on the track. And what won him that race was just pure stamina. At the top, I think at the top of the hill, he'd, in fact, Peter O'Sullivan, who was a commentator, he never ever mentioned the horse until approaching the last. I think at the top of the hill, he probably had, you know, 18 horses in front of him and two behind him. And then he just made relentless progress as he won at 66 to 1. Okay, at that time you were working with your father. Um, no. You weren't? No, I'd left. I'd left. <laughs> so I, mean, I was going to say, why did you not, you know, obviously with that success, you'd have thought maybe you'd have a burning ambition to follow in those footsteps. Uh, yeah, you'd have thought so, but I was, I want, I wanted money. I really wanted money, and and we, and whilst we, by the time we started training, two years in, we'd, we were training. I think we grew. Well, the business grew from three horses in 1981 
to 70 horses in 1987, probably training 50 winners a year on over flat and jumps. Uh, but I was the youngest of four. My father was brilliant at bringing in the owners, very, very sociable guy, well-liked, well-known. My eldest sister ran the yard with her husband, Pat Murphy, who she'd married, who'd been a jockey for, for Jim Old. Um, and I was a long way down the pecking order. And to have any influence and to see where this might go in the long term, I worked out that probably wasn't going to make any money being there. As much fun as it was. And, and the days when we, as the yard grew, was, um, we had so much fun. We used to have a bank on the other side of the farm, a three furlong bank where we'd work the horses. And when my father and my sister went about, we'd all get, the six or seven of us, we'd get at the bottom of the, yard, bottom of the hill and we'd sprint up over the hill as fast as we could and we'd bet on it. And then to make it more even the next time up, we, you, if you won one of the better horses, you had, to, you had to stay at the bottom and count to one or two before you were allowed to go. Um, but great days, fun days, yeah. So then you left and did you start working for Stephen Little? Uh, no, no, in 1987, I saw, and I thought I had to make my money, I thought I'd make it in business. So I saw an adver <laughs> advertisement in the um, uh, Daily Telegraph for, to work for Gallagher's who, who made Benson Hedges cigarettes and uh, Silk Cut cigarettes and I went and worked for them. Um, but I was always punting throughout the, the 80s, very much into the, into the form but, but not, you know, I was getting paid 40 quid a week from my dad, probably making 40 or 50 quid a week from punting. Still never really wondered where I was going to, you know, where was I going get, to get to the next level in life as far as, you know, financially was concerned. So, so you were making more than your wages punting, was that back in yeah, in the eighties. No, no, absolutely. That's the thing. Sorry, no, it wasn't. I can remember. I think the first. I was, <laughs> I was quite unusual for a child in that when I was say child sixteen, seventeen, is that I was happier sitting at home, reading form books than I was going out with my mates. So, there's one. There's one defining moment I think came for me. There was about 19, 1982, and it was December nineteen eighty two. I sat. I get finished work for my dad. Everyone would go out, I'd sit at the kitchen table in the evening, cup of tea, my Bristol Evening Post, which had the runners for tomorrow's racing, and a form book. And I just studied, I just studied the form. And I can remember that, I came up to the conclusion that three horses were going to win the next day. Observe, Egbelk and the Grey Bomber, and they all won. I didn't have them in a treble, I'd bet them all singularly. But that was made me believe, you know, f reading form was something, a passion, an absolute passion. You just, you know, I look back and think, I must have been a really weird 17 year old to to want to just sit there for a whole evening and just put my head in a form book i wouldn't look up i would not look out of that form book for six hours so then so when did you start you, you worked for Stephen little though yeah i did yeah yeah so where that was that probably when i so when i come back into racing probably 1989 between 1989 and 19 ended 1991 was the time that i spent time i wasn't i was never full time for steve but i used to work with him you know, on and off, um, sometimes for long periods of time. Great, great teacher. He wasn't a great fan, he wasn't a great teacher, but I learned a huge amount of Steve. And for people amount. that don't know, which is one of our previous uh, interviewees, was the probably biggest independent layer of his time. Absolutely. He would take massive bets. Massive bets, yeah. People could walk up to the rails and have 100 grand on a horse with Steve. Um, and the nice thing about Steve, and this is what I learned, I was going to talk to you about, you talked to me about inside information and people, there's a belief that people make it pay for an inside information. Well, during the period of time from 1981 to 1987, when I was making money from betting horses, 95% of it was not from my father's horses. Um, in fact, you could almost know too much about your horses. So I wanted to look at everything like with a blank canvas, not knowing about the horses. And Steve, who was the massive layer, hugely successful, he never had an opinion. He, he wouldn't tell you what, he wouldn't know what horses were running on a card until he put the odds up for the first race. But he wouldn't have a clue. And he would read the Sporting Life and Racing Post from cover to cover. He wouldn't read the form and he wouldn't read the race cards. Never had an opinion. And I've known Steve for, 38 years, he has never, ever given me a single opinion about a racehorse. And yet, as you know, Simon, he's probably one of, if not the most successful uh, bookmakers there's ever been in British racing, on course. Certainly, and it's interesting you say that the 1% of the value would be inside information. Well, surely if you fancy one that's not run for four months, it'd be good to know if that horse was fit. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, but you have to... Do, you have to sort of choose the races that you, that you play in, okay? So the races I play in, I try to play in the most complicated races that I can find. The more complicated, then the more edge I'm gonna have. So if I'm dealing with, say, a handicap hurdle with 18 runners and nine haven't run, then I would be inclined to avoid that race. So I'm looking for, for recent form. But a couple of lessons here. First of all, um, my inspiration for betting was a guy called Billy Boff, who my dad had met in the, like, the late 1970s, um, at sort of Wing Canton race course. And Billy was a guy that had come out of the army and made it pay from betting for 35 years or 32 years when he met my dad. When we, had, when we were having winners and runners in 1981, my dad would sit at home and wait for Billy to ring us to tell us what chance our horses had. So I'm, I'm hearing that as a 16 year old kid. So that's, so, you know, those are the younger years are the years when you're most influenced. So I'm thinking, okay, so here, there is somebody here that knows more about our horses than, I, than we do. We're riding them out every morning. So from that point onwards, inside information was nothing that I was ever going to be concerned with. And the other great story is my father had a, a, an owner, a, a very successful guy, trained a, a, he had a huge business, business in London worth in the tens of millions. He had horses with us. He had horses with trainers in Lambourne, Newmarket. And every morning he'd come on the phone, bark down the phone. What do you think today, Richard? Blah, blah, blah. He had the same phone calls, presumably, with every other trainer that he had horses with. And yet he was so successful at betting that the company that he bet with sent a rep to follow him around the, the race course to find out what bets he won wanted. He was just a, you know, he was a huge loser at betting, hugely successful in business. But anybody who thinks that inside information is important, uh, I think they're completely wrong. So was Billy Boff, was he an inspiration to you or did he actually teach you stuff? No, he was, an, well, he didn't really teach me I, because it's how can you, you can't really teach somebody when you're talking about a form book, but he was a real inspiration. So, because that's all he did. He, he just studied form. Um, and you have to think back then, Simon, there's no videos of races. So all he's doing is looking at a form book. I've, I actually inherited his form books that, that I've got uh, here. And you can sort of see how grubby they are and how, you know, they've been thumbed through so many times. And he just knew the form. He knew the form inside out. And it's all one horse in relation to another horse and sort of and trying to have them in a pecking order. So... Knowing that it could be done was an inspiration to me, and then getting on and doing it was the next step for me. Okay. 